and move us all in the direction you would have us to go. And we ask this in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, Lord willing, next week we're going to begin a study of the book of Ecclesiastes. And Ecclesiastes wrestles with some of life's most difficult questions. Uh, Questions like, uh, why is it that we see the wicked sometimes prosper while the righteous often struggle? Uh, Why is it that life is so often filled with suffering and so devoid of meaning? Uh, well, why is it that I, I can try a lot of things to be happy, and yet, no matter what I try, it seems really hard to find happiness? Uh, Ecclesiastes wrestles with questions like that. And Lord willing, next week, uh, we'll begin to tackle some of those questions as we study that book. And I would just encourage you this week, just begin reading Ecclesiastes, kind of getting your, yourself ready for our time in that book. Uh, but this morning is a morning I have been praying about uh, for almost a year now. And, uh, and what we have been praying is that over the past three weeks, as we've taken time in God's word to uh, think about what missions is, why missions matters, and the fact that every believer has been created and has been saved so that we might make disciples of all nations and take the good news of salvation in Christ to the ends of the earth, th- that this morning, Uh, the Lord would move in our church, that the Holy Spirit would move in our hearts and cause us to engage in the work of the Great Commission in in ways as of yet we we have never engaged, that we would just become more invested in that work that will last for all eternity. And and I've been praying that the Lord would do that this morning. And so this morning's going to look very different than a typical morning here, uh, but I am so glad you're here for this time with us. And and as I've been praying for the Spirit to move in that way, you, you know what could be a hindrance to us? You know what could stop us? Inertia. Uh, and, and inertia is simply the tendency for an object to keep doing what it's doing. Uh, it tells us that an object at rest tends to stay at rest. An object in motion tends to stay in motion unless it's acted upon by some outside force. And I've got this uh, basketball with me this morning, and uh, as it sits there, it is still, it's at rest. And as as long as nothing else acts on that basketball, it's going to stay at rest. It's just going to sit there. The inertia of the ball just keeps it there. But, But if I pick this ball up, if I act on this basketball as an outside force, if I, if I begin to dribble the ball, the, the reason I can dribble this ball is because of its inertia as well. Uh, once it begins to move, once it has been acted upon by an outside force, it doesn't just stop midair. It doesn't hit the ground and say, oh, I'll just sit and be still. Uh, once it is in motion, an object that is in motion tends to stay at motion unless it's acted upon by an outside force. And what I want you to see this morning is that inertia applies not only to basketballs, but it applies to believers as well. And so I want you to turn with me in your Bible to Acts chapter 1. If you brought your Bible, I would encourage you to turn there. If you've got a digital device you can use to pull up the scriptures, I'd encourage you to search for the ESV, the English Standard Version. That's the English translation of the Bible I'll be reading from this morning. And so if you search ESV Acts 1, you'll be able to follow right along with me. And I'm going to begin reading there in the book of Acts in chapter 1 with verse 1, where Luke writes these words. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they'd come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. 
And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. And this is God's word to us today. And what is happening in this text is uh, Jesus has died on the cross to take the penalty for our sin. He has risen from the dead. And he now appears to the apostles on Mount Olivet, about a day's walk outside Jerusalem. And there on the mountain, he says to the apostles, he says, here's what I want you to do, guys. I I want you to stay in Jerusalem until you receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And once the Holy Spirit comes upon you, then you're going to be empowered to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And those are Jesus' parting words. Like he says that, and then he just starts ascending up to heaven. And the apostles are are just watching as Jesus goes up to heaven until they can't see him anymore. And, And they are stunned. They're amazed. They're struggling to believe what they've just seen. And so they're just staring at the sky. And two angels appear by them, and the angels say, notice there in verse 11, they say, A men of Galilee, guys, (laughs) Why are you standing there staring at the sky? Do you not understand that this Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven, he's going to return the same way he went. And you got some work to do between now and the time he returns. You're supposed to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. So you better get back to Jerusalem so that you can be empowered by the Holy Spirit. So that's what the apostles do. They return to Jerusalem. And just what Jesus said would happen, happened. Uh, They are in Jerusalem, and the Holy Spirit comes upon them. They are empowered by the Spirit. It is an incredible experience. So incredible that in Acts chapter 2, the apostles are empowered by the Holy Spirit to speak in other tongues, such that everyone in Jerusalem hears the apostles preaching as though they were preaching in their own language. They are doing what Jesus said they would do. They are serving as witnesses for Christ in Jerusalem. And so do you know what happens in Acts chapter 3? Well, they they serve as witnesses for Christ in Jerusalem. And then in chapter 4, the apostles in the church, uh, they're still witnesses for Christ in Jerusalem. But in chapter 5, well, they're they're still in Jerusalem. So let's, uh, chapter 6. Still in Jerusalem, but chap, no, still, chapter 7, they're still, they're still in Jerusalem. Now, they're supposed to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to serve as witnesses for Christ in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. But seven chapters in, they're still in Jerusalem. Because believers are like basketballs and have a tendency to keep doing what they're doing. You see, the the church in Jerusalem, it's growing. And they're saying, man, this is great. Why would we ever go anywhere else? Like, we love it here. We're comfortable in Jerusalem. We're familiar with the place. And so they they are glad to be witnesses for Christ as long as they can stay where they are and keep doing what they're doing. They're not trying to abandon their assignment to make disciples of all nations. They're they're not trying to reject the the command to make disciples of all nations. They are just affected by missional inertia, the the tendency for an object to keep doing what it's been doing. And so they've sort of, you know, settled into their routine. I mean, uh, they're going to church on the Lord's Day together. They're singing together. They're praying together. They're witnessing to their neighbors. I mean, if you'd ask them, they'd say, oh, we're doing this following Jesus thing really well. We're knocking it out of the park. We'd definitely get an A plus from the Lord. But you see, their problem is they have forgotten that they were created for more than Jerusalem. They were saved for more than Jerusalem. They were created and they were saved so that they might make disciples of all nations. They were created, they were saved, they were empowered so they might be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. 
But believers are like basketballs. We have the tendency to keep doing whatever it is we've been doing. And what happened in Jerusalem in the first century can happen in Buda in the 21st century. So I wonder if you've kind of uh, settled into your own little Christian routine. And so you go to church, you sing, you pray, you go to this Bible study, you take your kids to Awana, your grandkids. I mean, these are just the things you do. And, and you've got your own little Christian routine. And you're doing the same things this year that you did last year. Maybe you're doing the same things this year that you've done for the last 10 years. Because it's comfortable. It's familiar. And there is missional inertia. Believers are like basketballs. We have a tendency to keep doing what we've been doing. But God hasn't called us to settle in a Christian routine here in Buda any more than he called the first Christians to settle into a routine in Jerusalem. He has created us and he has saved us. He has empowered us by the Holy Spirit so that we might serve as his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth, that we might make disciples of all nations. But you see, the, the, the problem with inertia is we, we have a tendency to keep doing what we've been doing unless we are what? Acted upon by an outside force. So do you know what God had to do to get the church in Jerusalem outside the city walls of Jerusalem so that they might begin to witness to the outside world? Uh, turn with me to Acts chapter 8, and we'll look at verse 1 together. There in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, we read, And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church where? In Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of where? Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. You see what is happening here? Because the believers in Jerusalem have settled into their little Christian routine that is comfortable and familiar and secure, God has to send persecution in order to scatter the believers outside of Jerusalem so that they will begin to fulfill their mission once again and serve as witnesses in places like Judea and Samaria and eventually to the end of the earth. And look, I don't want it to take persecution here in Austin or in America for God to get us out of our comfortable Christian routines and back engaged in the work of the Great Commission. And so I have been praying that the Lord would use other means. I've been praying that the Holy Spirit would move in our church, the Holy Spirit would move in your hearts, that you would be acted upon by an outside force, the Lord Jesus himself, through the power of the Holy Spirit, to say, you know what, I'm going to step out in faith, and I'm going to try something new to take the good news of Jesus to those who need to hear it. And I wonder, I wonder if, if you would be willing this morning to say, Lord, I know that this is what is true of me, that you have called every Christian, every Christian to be making disciples of all nations. And Lord, I've just kind of settled into what is familiar, what is comfortable, but Lord, I pray that you would move in my heart and empower me to try something new, to take the good news of Jesus to those who need to hear it, whether here in Hayes County or to the end of the earth. And so this morning, I, I want you to be able to hear from some of our folks about what the Lord has done and is doing in their lives to move them from where they are comfortable to be engaged in the work of the Great Commission and making disciples. Why don't you watch? I was about 33 when I placed my faith in Jesus. After spending most of my young adult life trying to fill my life with things and excitement, uh, I came to believe that only Jesus could fill me. I like to say I put my faith in Jesus at a really young age, uh, probably around six or seven years old. But I had no, no real idea what Savior meant. I had a love for him and I wanted to 
to do and, and learn more about him. Uh, but at that age, I also wanted to know more about race cars and airplanes. And I, I also love Butterfinger candy bars. And so that was about uh, the extent of, of where I put my faith at that young age. Uh, I felt my faith was fully in Jesus Christ around 22 years old. But then at uh, probably around 30, I felt like I had more than ever before. And now even at 51, I look back at myself at 45 and think, well, you were you were lacking. So uh, so I guess every day I give my faith to him and it just grows stronger. When I was a child, I believed in Jesus and was baptized, but it was actually later on, maybe five or six years after that, that I actually started living for him. I also had the privilege of growing up in a Christian home. And as a five-year-old, I put my faith in Jesus. I grew up in a church where I was baptized as a baby. Therefore, growing up, I thought I was saved. There were missalettes you followed along in instead of the Bible. The Bibles were there in the pew. I just never opened one. I was surrounded by a big, loving family, but there was still an emptiness I could never quite understand growing up. At the age of 18, an older woman named Pam befriended me and started sharing the gospel with me. Her love and joy for God was infectious, and I wanted what she had. I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior that year and bought my first Bible. I'll never forget my first Bible study. It was the book of John. I felt so loved, and it filled the hole I had growing up. When I was a junior in college. I was a senior in high school. When I took perspectives and learned how many people never heard of Jesus and that the only way they would is if I started to tell them, it really inspired me. When it, whether they are neighbors or far away in a different country, if we do not share, they will not hear. In my 20s, we were settled in Salado and we loved our church home, and I continued to grow in my faith and started discipling. I served on the praise and worship team for many years, and my children, two children grew up in Awanas and had a great community of friends. It was our church home for over 20 years, and I am beyond thankful for the time there. For years, I led Bible studies at my salon once a week during lunch hour discipling women. I did not only want my employees to grow in their profession, I wanted them to grow spiritually. God placed me in a position of leadership where I could disciple to women and impress on them, upon them the love of Jesus. It was truly an honor. As I continued to grow my faith and my children grew older, my focus became my children and their friends. My home was always open and my pantry was fully stocked. It was Grand Central for years and I loved every minute of it. I wasn't preaching the gospel every day. I was loving on them and showing them Jesus. Uh, my faith, it was it's something that had been in my heart for decades, uh, but, but that's kind of where it stayed. I kept my relationship uh, with the Lord just to myself, uh, basically mine. I studied alone, worshiped, prayed, etc. And uh, then I had a pretty bad accident uh, in 2004, uh, March 31st, 2004, uh, where I broke my sternum, uh, six ribs, uh, got my left lung, some uh, loss of intestine, I lost my spleen. Uh, it, was, it was a pretty serious come to Jesus moment. And at that point in time, I, I literally thought seriously about the Exodus uh, 424. Um, he had to do what he had to do, and uh, the reason he kept me around, I, I just looked at discipleship. So, uh, so me and him had some started having some charged discussions on how to go about this. Uh, the accident was actually a blessing. It was something that I looked at uh, as a blessing. It gave me witness. It also gave me a, a drive to tell people what Jesus meant to me, and it kept their attention while I was doing it. A little over three years ago, Pastor Aaron mentioned they were looking for volunteers to serve as the one leaders during the church service. 
That was all he had to say, sign me up. I had no idea what I was doing. I just wanted to be part of something that was so big in my children's lives. Selfishly, I also knew it would help me to train up my grandchildren in the way that they should go. I guess you could say it was a fresh refresher course of sorts. A few months ago, my husband and I recently started leading a children's Sunday school class on Sunday mornings as well. Serving as a couple has really been fun. Leading may sound scary, and you may not think you are the one for the job or that you may not know enough. I promise you, Hayes Hills has such a great program to guide you in what you teach. You have a curriculum to follow. I will say there's some preparation, but not much. And you may even learn along the way. The biggest part for me is being able to connect with the kids and pour Jesus into them. I took a missions trip at age 17 and my rebellion against God afterwards for me to get to the point of surrendering to God and being willing to do whatever he wanted, wherever he wanted. I was overseas for two months, and during that time I saw how hard missions was. I came back to the USA telling God that I would be too miserable to follow anything he would want me to do. Thankfully, God got my attention, and I finally realized that my genius plan of running my own life only ended up in misery, while submitting to the King of Kings led to peace. As I repented and got right with God, I began to find joy in helping others find the same joy in God too. For me, it was in college, and it was fellow Christian college uh, mates who asked me to go and do evangelism with them and to go and serve outside of the church with them. And that Christian college group really transformed my life on this topic. Going through a study called Spiritual Multiplication, I learned that everyone needs to hear the gospel. And I am called to share the call to share really came to life for me. Their approach was called, was to fish for people, to find people, identify their interests, share the gospel with them, and help them make a decision for Christ. Discipleship starts before making a decision for Jesus. The disciples spent three years with Jesus before they asked him, who do you say I am? Discipleship is not a once and done conversation or a quick conversation. It's a relationship over time, sharing life with people who need to know Christ. Recently, Pastor David asked if some of the leaders would be interested in Simeon Trust Bible training for leaders. I'm excited to take on this challenge to learn and see where God takes this. I know it will only strengthen my discipling. I want to thank all the pastors at Hayes Hills for everything they do to lead his sheep, their servant hearts, and all the tools they supply us with to serve him in each and every way possible. For us in Bulgaria, making disciples involves speaking three languages, speaking with kindness to strangers, speaking about Jesus as often as possible, and serving the rejects of society by caring for orphans and those with disabilities. Discipleship involves teaching local believers through Bible study, as well as letting them into our lives so they can see Jesus changing us. Yeah, I think the key parts are we're being intentional that when we go out and live our lives, that we're trying to bring the conversation to Jesus Christ. And as people make decisions to follow Christ, that we uh, read the Bible with them and we work through their issues together with them life on life. So about seven years ago, uh, I made a choice to leave my industry. Um, I was the paint tech manager for AMM Collision Centers, and uh, refinishing collision was my industry. Um, I've had a lot of people ask me, uh, why would I do that? And basically, I don't feel like it was my decision. I had a high school principal call me one night, and he said that they were looking for an instructor for their refinishing collision program. I told him I definitely uh, would not do that, uh, but that I would consult with him on the curriculum and the certifications uh, required for the program. And this went on for about four months. And uh, then once not, well, one night he, he called me and uh, he said something that, that, that kind of changed uh, the direction. He said, uh, something tells me that you're a man of God and that you know God wants you here with these kids. And, and with that, I, I became a high school teacher uh, for a Title I campus in a highly economically deficient area. 
Um, we started a thing um, back about five years ago where we do a, a, a Wednesday morning Bible study. Um, we cut off for a little while for COVID, but we're back now. Um, not a huge group. Um, just uh, just trying to get them introduced to God and the gospel and uh, replace some of the confusion with understanding. Um, most of the kids come from a Catholic, uh, Catholic uh, upbringing, Catholic families, or they have uh, been just disengaged, uh, never been engaged. They're, they're learning to publicly pray and, and to lead prayer um, and that Jesus was the greatest superhero ever. Uh, and like I said, we're a small group, uh, but we're a group nonetheless. And um, I, I thank God every day for tolerating uh, the Jonah that I can I can tend to be, and uh, for every kid He's graced me with. In the last several months, I've helped to start a community group in my neighborhood, focused on sharing Jesus and meeting neighbors. Leading the study through the book of John show the gospel to those who have may, who have not heard it or may never have encountered it uh, is where we started. A fruit of our group came last week when we saw a new neighbor and his wife join us for our potluck dinner. They are Hindu and just wanted to have community. We were able to invite them and share time with them. This week, I get to follow up and continue to invest time with them. Following Jesus' example, a third to half of all the stories of the gospel are Jesus going to, at, or coming from a meal. Breaking bread with non-believers is a great way to share the bread of life. Would you rejoice with me in what the Lord's doing in and through our brothers and sisters? And here's the thing. You see how easy it is? How easy it is for normal people like you and me to just say to the Lord, Lord, where would you have me to make disciples? Uh, the nations have come to us. They're peoples from every nation all, all around us here in Central Texas. Uh, there are people in Hayes County who need to hear the gospel. And so there is great commission work all around us. And so in your seat this morning, you have a list of ways you can engage in the work of the Great Commission. Just some suggestions. Um, here in a moment, we are going to sing a song of response. And uh, the way we want you to respond this morning is a little bit different. You, you can come forward. I'll be here at the front. And if there's something going on in your life that you would like for me to be able to pray with you and, and for you about, maybe uh, something difficult in life, maybe there's something great you want to rejoice in the Lord's presence, I'd love to be able to do that. If you've got some questions about how Jesus can forgive you of your sins and give you eternal life, I'd love to have that conversation with you as well here at the front. Uh, but the main way we want you to respond to the reading and preaching of God's word this morning and to the testimonies of your brothers and sisters in Christ is that you would move to these outside walls where these tables are set up. And as we're singing, you would just get information about ways you can try something new. Step out in faith and try something new uh, to get involved and take the good news of Jesus Christ to those who need to hear it. And so uh, we've got uh, a table that's going to be leading trips. If you just say, look, I'm nervous about sh speaking the gospel to someone, we've got a table where you can sign up and you can have someone who is comfortable and confident in evangelism go with you and kind of train you in that. Uh, we've got uh, opportunities for you to plug in with many of our missions advocacy teams to encourage workers on the ground, take trips uh, to see them and bless them, uh, opportunities for you to get involved in our transitional housing for single mom uh, ministry, opportunities with the pregnancy center here in town, opportunities to bless international uh, students that have come to our universities, so many ways that you can get involved. And so I want to I wanna pray for this time of response and then we will sing and, and the Lord will, will move in your hearts and move you where he needs to move you. Will you pray with me? Father, we do thank you uh, that you are a God who acts. Uh, we, are, we are thankful that you do not leave us to ourselves stuck in our inertia, but Father, that your Holy Spirit moves in our lives. And Lord, I pray right now, as I've been praying for almost a year, that you would move in the hearts of our church, God, that you would, you would cause us to step out in faith in, in new ways to take the news of Jesus to those around us and to the end of the earth. And so, Father, this time is yours, and we, we pray, Father, that you would do a great work. And we ask it in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to invite you to stand as we sing.
And as we sing, you, you move and do what the Lord would have you.